All right, now they're going to talk about the uh, little bit of new uh, new shell coating and a little humor along the way. Go ahead, fellas. Hi, hello, DefCon. How are you today? Brilliant. Very glad to be here today. We're going to talk about the ABC of next generation shell coating. A lot of interesting things. So let me just say a few words of disclaimer before I begin. Don't look at what's written there. We are going to have a deep dive into the dark arts of shell coating. We'll use brute force, mathematics, wizardry, a bit of dancing. We'll make your head spin at some point. And the idea will be to build up obscure incantations to make computers do things they shouldn't do. We'll conjure monsters, give you nightmares, and hopefully you'll stay until the end so that you know why we do all these things. So just a few words about who we are, uh, the three of us. You've got Adrien, Georges Axel, and myself. Uh, we, we work at university, we work, we work as researchers in security, and the point of the talk today, more precisely, is creative methods, and I insist on creative, to write shell codes, or exploitation code, under constraints, on new architectures, and we will illustrate that on an architecture that is not even easy to find actually right now, because it's uh, not yet deployed very much. So just a reminder, who, who amongst you has ever written a shell code? Just raise your hands for me. Well, that's half. Yeah, okay. So you know how it works, so you think at least. Um, for the other half, this is what the shell code is. It is essentially code that you wrote or found in a target's memory and that you want to jump to. And usually it's, it, it pops a shell, so that's why you call it a shell code. And then once, once you have a shell, you do whatever you like. To, to actually jump to the shell code, uh, you have to trigger a vulnerability, a, a buffer overflow, a use after free, a type confusion, whatever. Um, but the typical scenario is that your target uh, runs a program, the program accepts user input. And so you write user input, you carefully craft user input so as to inject your code in memory and jump to it. So you have a nice picture on the screen there. The target's memory uh, gets the payload inserted and then you jump to it using the vulnerability. So that's very nice. The issue with that is that it's not that easy. For those of you who actually wrote shell codes, you know it's not trivial. Um, there are constraints because it has to pass as user input, so you can't have uh, terminating zeros in, in your strings. There might be stack protections. You may have limited memory. You may not know where the shell code is in memory. That's, tr that's annoying, really. It turns out you can work around these constraints. You, you, ca you can always succeed, nevertheless, uh, using clever techniques. We are not going to talk about the techniques to bypass existing mit mitigations because, well, they're well known. And that's not the point of the talk today. What I'm going to talk about is the fact that the shell code, such as this thing, does not look like user input. I mean, perhaps you guys input such things, but the normal human beings, which are not here today, would not. And there are several things that give it away. Uh, things such as um, the presence of NOP characters, NOP instructions in the code, the non-printable characters in it, the presence of suspicious substrings such as BNSH, and the fact that you have bits that, I mean, look like well-known malware, for instance, side to side. So this is suspicious and this is detectable, which means antivirus or blue teams or, I mean, your annoying neighbors will find out that what you're writing is actually a shell code and perhaps make it uh, a problem for you. So we try to stay under the radar. And one idea to do that, one illustration of that, to pass as human inputs, especially for strings, is that you want your shell code to be written using, for instance, just ASCII characters, ASCII printable characters, or perhaps just alphanumeric characters for username, for instance, perhaps English words, if you just want to write poetry, you feel inspired, it turns out to be a shell code. Or why not even Shakespeare's codes? So why would you do that? Well, for one, 
if it really looks like it's just English text, it does not trigger alarm that much and you have plausible deniability. You could just say, this is poetry, this is the lyrics of my next song. Right? It's, it, is, it is not an NSA implant. Well, of course it is. Anyway. It is also less likely to be escaped or broken because it is already text. It doesn't have any special character, so your exploit might work better. And if everything else fails, you can always try the pickup line at the bar, okay? So do try that. The only question remaining is, is that feasible? Can I write my code, my programs, my eternal blue, using only English words? Yes. Take the x86 instruction set for instance and just look at what the letters look like when you disassemble. You've got for capital letters A to O you've got uh, in increment and decrement operations. For the others you've got push and pop, so you stack operations. You've got jumps, you've got XOR, so you can actually do a lot of things. Right? It turns out uh, Riggs and others have shown the x86 ISA is extremely nice and smooth when you try to write alphanumeric code. You, you've got everything you need and you can even make it work on 64 bits architecture almost trivially. So here is a full shell code that works on x86 64 written entirely using letters and, and numbers. Very fine, you can print that on a t-shirt, right? Just, that's what you should do. Now, you can actually go further than that. Well, you can even go further and uh, for example here we will see how to do for so, uh, some English shell coding. So it has been published uh, almost exactly 10 years ago by Mason and, uh, and others. Uh, the idea is uh, to do exactly the same as previously but now this time you will generate an English compatible subset of x86. So this is exactly alphanumeric as before but you have even more than alphanumeric characters so you can have spaces, you can have punctuation, uh, you can have uh, colons, semicolons, you can have dashes, uh, you can have some special characters uh, and for example it gives you even more instructions uh, than that. For example if you look at point you can have more uh, operands available as before and if you look for example at space you have one more opcode uh, which gives you the end instruction. So we have more than that. So the fundamental idea behind that is that you do a normal shell code, so you write a small decoder with those instructions, then you cut it into sno small snippets of code that would fit into English words, then you have some gaps, you, uh, and those gaps you can jump from each snippet uh, to another using ju the jump instructions you can see there, and just the idea is to fill those gaps with something that makes your shell code look like English, uh, English text. Of course this is done using Markov chains. Uh, so Markov chains fundamentally are just uh, the auto completion uh, feature on your iPhones. So you write a word and then it gives you some other words. So it can give you some pretty nice text uh, if you write uh, some, uh, uh, some, uh, some SMSs with uh, that. And, uh, and you just have a text that looks like English code, uh, that looks like, you just have a shell code that looks like English text you send it to the to the to the vulnerability application and you enjoy and you have your root shell. So let's have a little demo for that. So this is what I did on my computer. So here we would go for a standard uh, set user ID exploitation. So the ID is you have uh, the ID behind it is that you have a program that would be executed as a root program but it can be executed by the standard user. For example, if you want to change your password, then it has to be a root action that has to be done by uh, the standard user. So you have a program executing on root. So here we give it the set user ID permission. And when we switch to the user, so we can have our program here that says that you have the small s in the permissions that says you it gets executed as root. And the ID is to send a shell code to it so that it does something else that what it was supposed to do. So here we have our English text here. We just write it, we send it, and we have the uh, root uh, shell that pops out so we can check that indeed we are root here. <laughs> mm. 
more generally, uh, when we speak about x86, uh, it's almost fully solved. So the idea is that you have, uh, for example, MSF phenom. So you just say I want uh, some shell code on x86 with these restrictions on the instruction set. So I want only alphanumeric. I want alpha plus uh, some characters. I want something that looks like a new URL. I want something that looks like uh, a path and this kind of thing. And it automatically generates you uh, whatever is required so that uh, it everything goes well. In principle, we could even write uh, some fully functional shell codes from only Shakespeare works. Uh, but uh, what we will be sp uh, speaking about uh, in the next uh, part of the talk would not be on x86 uh, because now we have more and more devices that are running on something else than x86. Uh, and I'll give a, I'll give a bit to read. Yeah, so challenge for you, by the way, the, the Shakespeare cell code. We did not do it, do it for us. Now we're going to take risks. And as it was just mentioned, what m powers most devices today is slowly drifting away from x86, including phones, including voting machines, including several interesting things that we'd like to run shellcodes on. Um, and to do that, we need to look at the way, for instance, risk instructions such as ARM um, work. It turns out that you cannot use the techniques we just described on ARM. The reasons are you do not have any more single character instructions. We do not have as many addressing modes. In particular, we lack, we lack the memory to memory addressing modes. And we have constraints on operands that make it very tricky and actually, so far, impossible to write shellcodes for RISC V. Uh, it does not work. Uh, on, on, on ARM architectures as, as well. Um, so I'm going to talk about three approaches very quickly about the two, the, the two uh, compilation and emulation technique and a bit more about unpacking technique. So three ways around these limitations that allow us to work nevertheless. The compilation approach, the first approach, consists in compiling assembly code directly to the constraint instruction set, so directly to alphanumeric for instance, uh, operations. The, the good things about it is that it may be possible to compile to one instruction set uh, easily. That's the Morphuscator, for instance, written by Christopher Thomas, uh, does that. The, the, the main disadvantage of such an approach is that uh, it does not work when the constraints are on the operands and not on the opcodes. And also, who wants to write a compiler? I mean, if, if Chris Domas is in the, in the room, do it, please, by all means, but we won't. That's just a lifetime's work. Second approach, the emulation way. To do that, you write an interpreter for some language, you write your payload in that interpreted language, and uh, you just run that. The thing is, you have to write the imp interpreter um, once, and once that's done, well, you can reuse it for different payloads works quite well. It's feasible. It's been done by Yunnan and, and Philippettes uh, for ARM7. They did a brain fuck interpreter and well, that works. The issue with that is what? Well, it's interpreted, which means it's toothless. You cannot really call syscalls. You cannot really do fancy stuff that you'd like to do with the shellcode, right? So this leaves us with the third approach, which we introduced some years ago. And the idea is a several step process. So let me just take some time to explain that one. The first step is that your payload will be encoded in a constraint compliant way. So for instance, if you want an alphanumeric shellcode, you would first encode it in some uh, alphanumeric way. You hide it, as you can see on the top right picture. Then you look at the ISA targeting and you identify high level constraint compliant constructs. So a set of instructions that, that, that fits with your constraints and allows you to do some basic operations, building blocks, zeroing a register, increasing a register. And using these building blocks, you build an unpacker, something that decodes in memory, in self-modifying code, the payload. We write a minimal unpacker because we don't want to spend too much time on that and we just don't care about the unpacker that much. We want to run the payload. So the unpacker decodes and executes the payload. This is straight there. Sorry. Oh. So on 
on ARM V8, this is the demo of this approach, very quickly speaking. Um, we run, sorry, so you've got the application there. Uh, this application takes a string as input, for instance, a username. We paste there the shellcode, which is written with this unpacker strategy. Um, so here is the shellcode, you can see it's mostly letters. We run that, we just paste it. And once that's run, it unpacks in memory, executes it, and here is the shadow or the, or the target. Okay, so now that you saw how you ca we can we can bypass the limitations of usual ARM processes, uh, as if we everyone is turning around from AX86, we're going to turn our attention to Risk Five for various reasons. Thank you. So, Risk Five. Maybe you've never heard about it. It is a new architecture. Uh, basically, it is a, a, once again a Risk architecture. Very much like MIPS, if you heard about it. It aims at being open source and also open hardware. And it is still very work in progress. And by this, I mean that the specification is not completely done yet. There is very few silicon available. But hopefully, uh, in a few, few years, we'll see risk five everywhere. There are many companies interested in it. So that remains to be seen. But hopefully, it is the architecture of the future. We do have one issue with risk five when it comes to alphanumeric shell coding, it is that it makes our job much, much harder. So, let's look at what is available for us in alphanumeric risk five. So first, we can load a few constant with typically the load, load immediate and load upper immediate. Then we have small increments. If you combine both of them, it means you can load quite a lot of values in registers. Then we have some branches, both conditional and unconditional, but only forward branches. We do not have any backward branches, so that's an issue. Then we have a single uh, arithmetic instruction, which is a right shift. Why not? And then we have a system register write. Uh, the issue with this, this instruction is that it is only available at higher privilege levels. Typically, it would work if you uh, are attacking uh, Linux, or your, oper your operating system, but not just a simple program on it. So we will just forget about them since we want something quite generic. And finally, we do have miscellaneous floating point operations. So as you've seen, we have no loops because no backward jump, no store, and no syscall. Eh, we're, we start. And I can even tell you it is not even Turing complete. So let's look at what a typical RISC V instruction is. If you look at the servant's low bits of the binary representation of the instruction, you have the opcode, and servant bits is exactly what an ASCII character is. So we will just allow ourselves uh, one more single printable character. As a spoiler, I can tell you that there are three useful printable characters that can uh, go, uh, make us go out of a uh, no loop, no store, and no syscall issue. We have hash, slash, and tick. Typically, hash will give us uh, regular stores. With regular stores, we can write our unpacker. So let's look at how it works uh, for uh, writing alphanumeric plus hash uh, shellcode on RISC files. So, Here's the architecture. We have three stages. Uh, on the left is the stage one. First, we have some initialization. Then we do use a forward jump, which is a jump and link. Uh, with a jump and link, it means that you can actually get the PC of a shellcode, which is quite useful if you do not know exactly where your shellcode is in memory. Since we have a forward jump, we have some wasted space. So we use the wasted space to uh, put the encoded payload. Then we write our unpacker. This is the hard thing to do. But we won't unpack directly the payload. We will first unpack a stage two. The reason we do this is because uh, it is difficult to write a generic unpacker, but writing an unpacker for a specific code is much easier. So we have our stage two. 
our stage two is much more straightforward. It is just a simple decoded loop, which because now we have loops because we just impact something. So uh, stage two will impact the final encoded payload, and then we won. We have something which works. So uh, let me just show you a little demo on the only silicon available right now, which is the high five unleashed board. Okay. So we see basically what the shell code looks like. Uh, you can see that basically all the hashes that correspond to our store instructions. This time uh, we assume we have a vulnerable uh, network application. We will just uh, send it, uh, send our shellcode on the socket. As you can see, we've sent it. We now have a root shell. We can check that we are indeed root. And if we check the CPU type, it is indeed a RISC V CPU in the middle. That's all. Well, let's go a little bit dirtier. Uh, so we have seen what uh, hash can do. So it gives you uh, standard stores. Uh, so now we will switch to the other character, which is to another character, which is slash. Uh, which can be really useful when you are writing, for example, URL, URLs or path uh, in uh, in uh, Linux uh, operating systems. Uh, of course, switching to hash uh, to slash instead of slash of hash uh, does not give us standard stores anymore so we have to find a new ri a memory writing primitive uh, to compensate for that. Of course slash is not taken uh, out of nowhere uh, because this uh, character gives us atomic operations uh, so we have two uh, mainly useful atomic operations so the first one for example aq3 slash gives us atomic or and the other is atomic end. Fundamentally an atomic or operation reads 64 bits from the memory stores it in a register and then stores back to the memory the same uh, value or with another register. So the end is exactly the same with the end operation instead of or. Of course, uh, so given that I can read and write 64 bits into the memory, so this is a memory writing primitive. So the idea is just to, uh, to write my stage two with those instructions. However, in RISC V, uh, there is a little constraint for uh, atomic operations, which was not there for stores. Uh, and it says that the address held in uh, the register must be naturally aligned to the size of the operand. And if the address is not naturally aligned, a misaligned extra exception will be generated. So that's fine. It's, six, it's 8 bytes. I have to align it at 8 bytes. So the idea is I have a pointer to which I write to. I write my 8 bytes. Then I increase this, this pointer by 8 and I continue writing it. So we have to use some add immediate instruction that will allow us to increase the pointer. So we look at the available instructions, we look for the add immediate, then we take the shortest one and of course the shortest add is of 16. So we are fucked now so we will have to find a way to go out of it. Uh, the solution is to use uh, 16 byte chunks because we are obliged to move our pointer bar 16 bytes, out of which only the 8 are controllable. So the idea is we will use 6 only out of them, so it's even better. Uh, and we will put an instruction at the beginning, uh, that will be our real instruction of the stage 2, then an up like operation, and then we will put a jump instruction that will jump to the next block. Uh, here we decided to put 2 bytes and 2 bytes instead of 4 bytes of instruction because it was easier to build uh, the shell code and just because we are lazy. So, so using some black magic, uh, so I will explain all of this, all of it uh, step by step. So here is uh, the example of uh, some code that allows you to to write exactly one block to load into the memory one block, and uh, we will use uh, some GDB uh, over uh, Beamer uh, to look how what it does exactly. So other black magic here, uh, we load uh, in the initialization section a uh, magic value in uh, the TP uh, register, which is A0410004. And let's go step by step to it. So first we would zero S4. Then we would do the atomic end to the uh, chunk, which in practice would zero all the, ch uh, the first eight bytes of the chunk, which is exactly what we want. Then we would do the OR with the register that has the magic value. So it loads A0 31 into the memory. 
which is exactly what we want because this is a jump 12 which will jump to the next block. Then you load a magic value into A0. You shift it by 12. You subtract 10 out of it and then you do again an atomic R uh, to the memory which would lo load into the, the chunk 97A0 and 0005. 97A0 is exactly add A4, A4, SP which is one of the instructions of the stage 2 and 0005 is the NOP operation which is exactly what we want. So the idea behind it is that you do exactly the same for every instruction of your stage 2. So you had a load upper immediate instruction, you shift it by an amount and then you put some add uh immediate instructions, so small or bigger, uh on 32 bits uh and uh, you just brute force on all those instruction sequences. So at the end it will allow you to load one value into the the, the chunk. So if you have several instru instruction sequences that do the same thing, you keep the shortest one. And if your stage 2 does not fit into the instruction sequences you found, so you just modify it, will you tweak it a little bit and this will give you. So here is exactly the stage 2. So sorry I had no place uh for putting it uh vertically so just please turn your head 90 degrees. Uh so here if we look at it you have exactly uh the instructions. Uh, okay so let me put it back uh in the right order. So you have the the body of the loop so everybody knows what's in the body of the loops so let me take it out. Here it becomes normal I think. Okay. So let's get back. So you have the jump instructions. You have your NOP instructions so you have a uh, left shift at the end which is which shifts uh, a register that we do not care about so it's a NOP like instruction. And you have the real stuff here which is exactly the stage 2. And we had some you have the 2 bytes instructions and there is one instruction that is 4 bytes long which is the fence instruction which allows you to clear the cache uh if you have a self modifying code this is absolutely essential. Uh and for this we just hand wrote uh, the the instruction sequence and it's only one instruction though so that's fine. So let's get back to the demo. So here. So we still have our shellcode here so you can see the slash uh, characters that tell you that it's an atomic operation. And we will send it to the same application that has another filter now so instead of filtering out all uh the hash characters so it will only keep the slash characters. So we send it. We got our shell. So we do ID. This is root. And if we check again the CPU, so it's again risk five. Okay, so let us look at this nice quote from XKCD. Either you're handing out raw floating point variables, sorry, or you've built a database to track individual atoms. In either case, please stop. Well, I'm very pleased to tell you that we are not going to build a database to track individual atoms. Which means we are going to have fun with floating points. The last character, tech, gives us, gives us floating point stores. And that's really difficult to work with. So, as a, woman, as a reminder, we only want to change the unpacker, so other parts of our architecture do not change. But instead of using regular stores or atomic store, we need to write our first unpacker with floating point stores. So, uh, floating point 101 for people who need it. Uh, floating point representation in memory uh, has three fields mantissa, exponent, and the sign, and the mathematical representation of this. Uh, binary representation, representation is very roughly mantissa times 2 to the power of the exponent plus the sign bit. It is very rough, but it's much enough for this presentation. So, our idea to write the inpacker is to first load some floating point value from the mem memory. Since it is from the memory, it means that it must be alphanumeric. Then do some computation, and hopefully at the end we have a chunk about of our stage 2 in uh our register which we can just store it to memory. We repeat this for each chunk and we have our unpacker. Obviously the issue here is which value do I pick and which computation do I do? Well uh let's look at what is available on Alpha Nuray Quiz 5 on the term of floating point operations. So first we have loads and stores. Well that's a good thing. 
And then we have, we need to find our operation to work on those loaded values. So first we have quad to double conversions, but since we do not have double to quad, it's like not super useful. Then we have sign manipulation, such as, for example, taking the absolute value of a floating point register, but it will only change a single bit in the register, so it's not super useful. And finally, we do, we do have fused multiply add instructions, which has multiple variants. So, uh, fused multiply add is an operation which has three inputs and one output. And basically, it combines a multiply and a add in a single instruction. So, uh, it's A times B plus C, and the variants have some minus sign in the middle. So, for example, if we have the instruction FM sub. Uh, FT6, FS2, FT4, FA0, it means that the floating point register T6 will be set to the result of H2 times T4 minus A0. So, uh, here's how we want to store a chunk our stage 2. Let's say we want to store the 16 bit value ABCD in hexadecimal. On the right, you can see our uh, fuse multiplier instruction, and we need to set A, B, and C. Which must all be alphanumeric, such that a uh, does contains a, b, c, d in the end. So, first we'll just take a random thing for a. Okay, why not? Then, same thing we will take a random thing for b. And at this time, at this point, we only have a single input left, so we can mathematically solve for it. And in this time, if we want a to have a, b, c, d in the low bits, it means that C is something quite difficult, BZ and non alpha mu character, so it doesn't work. So, what we do is that we try again, we take another B, again, solve mathematically on it, this time we are lucky, C is alphanumeric, as you can see it is BBOQ CCZ6, and this time we have a good result in R. So, you, you might want to ask, how, how long do I have to try to find good Bs? Well, not that much, only 10,000 times. And since we're doing it on a computer, 10,000 tries is like nothing. So it's like really efficient. And I don't have a proof of it for you here, but I can tell you, just trust me, that it works if I change ABCD to anything. It works for all 16 bit values. And even better than that, when we wrote our thing, we saw that we could actually control much more than 16 bits. As you can see uh, on the right, uh, on the left, uh, the just before ABCD, we have lots of zeros, which, which means we can actually control all those bits. Otherwise, that would be random. So we can actually have all 48 bits, which means that with three, three, uh, three 64 bits value, we get 48 bits of outputs. So well, we have quite a good impacter here. So we do it for every part of our stage two, and then again we have an impacter and all the rest works fine. So, again, a little demo. So, you have already said it, but this time it is with tech. So, uh, on top you can see the encoded payload, on the bottom you can see the unpacker with all text corresponding to a floating point store. Once again, we are sending it to our vulnerable application, which this time accept alphanumeric plus tick. We get our root shell. As you can see, we are root. And once again, you can guess it, this is the same CPU. It is still a risk five CPU. Okay, I hope you did not expect that. Um, so we th we went through different new techniques to write code. We focus on alphanumeric, but as you can probably imagine, these are tricks that some of them weren't known before. We try to bring you to navigate the yoga of writing constrained shell code, to avoid filters, to fool ideas and humans as well, to target specific applications. Um, as we mentioned, the x86 environment is already quite mature. So this is a solved problem there, almost. But new architectures, and particularly RIX-5, is something that's, that's gaining momentum, and we need to keep up. It would be unacceptable 
that it goes public before we have attacks for it, right? So we show that it is possible to write alphanumeric shell codes uh, even on very constrained instruction sets. And what we described to you, the unpacker, was the hard part, really. The decoder was the hard part. And now what remains is just to put your payload, any payload, arbitrary payload. This is a world first, by the way. So more than tricks and techniques, uh, we have introduced new approaches that can be transported to other architectures. And for those of you who are really curious how to use that, um, for once, do come to uh, our talk next week. Uh, the, do read the paper that, we're going to, yeah, that has been published uh, yesterday. All the code is open source. You can actually find everything there if you're curious. And you have no excuse whatsoever. So no get hashing and slashing and ticking for fun and for profit. Uh, read the code. Send us a friendly email. Thank you very much, your friendly neighborhood hackers. <laughs>